Hey, everybody. Welcome to Eureka Moments Only. We have David Perry on the show. David. Thanks for inviting me. It's so cool to be back here. Yeah, absolutely. You've been a part of the Eureka fabric for a long time now. Yeah, our office, um, uh, we had an office just down the street, actually. And so, yeah, it was always fun to pop over here. You have a little cafe downstairs and that I used to, yeah. to come and grab lunches there. It was awesome. But um, yeah, no, Peter's been a great help to us. Uh, and so, you know, it's fun to come back and see the place. It's a bit quiet today, but don't know where everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> We're the only ones working. Huh? Yeah, what's going on? It's five o'clock. Everyone's gone. I'm not just kidding. It's a holiday today. So you're working on a holiday. Impressed. Impressive. <laughs> Very impressed. Um, David, you've you've done a Eureka Moments only video before and you covered some of those moments, but we want to go a little bit deeper today and, and learn a little bit more about your background. Mm -hmm. So please tell me a little bit more about yourself. Well, I'm actually... Um, I, I, I sound American, but I'm actually Irish. I don't have the, the whole Irish accent, but I grew up there. I was born there, went to school there. And um, I really got into to making video games. And I didn't, I, it, there was this, this idea that there's something that you're supposed to do in the world. And when you find out what it is, um, there's a book on it called The Element. And you're sort of working out what your element is. Mm. And, and when you find it, it makes you dangerous because you're willing to do it for free. Other people have to be paid to do this thing, right? But not you. You're, I'd put a million hours in for free. So that's that makes that's a good thing. The problem was there was no video game business in Northern Ireland, and so I had to move to England. And I thought that was going to be it. I was good to go. I was making some cool games. Did the the um, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I was number one in the charts. So I thought I had arrived. Like that's that's the video game industry. And mm -hmm. that's the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. Um, but I didn't really understand how big video games were going to become. It was still mm -hmm. actually quite small um, back then. And, and nowadays it's huge. But the big market was really the U.S. And so I got a call once um, that said it was from Virgin Games. Remember, uh, Richard Branson had a video game company, Virgin Games. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from the CEO and he said, we're having a problem. We need to make a game for McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Get on a plane. Just go to the airport, get on a plane, and uh, and come to a, come to America. And they sort of positioned it as Los Angeles. And mm. I thought this is really cool because uh, you know there's all these amazing beaches in Los Angeles, and this is this this unbelievable um, paradise. But um, what was so funny is I arrived late at night in Los Angeles, and someone met me at the airport, and then drove me away from Los Angeles to some place called Irvine, which is right here. <laughs> Where's that? Right, <laughs> and I'm like. Irvine? No one said Irvine. <laughs> Where are all the beaches? <laughs> and uh, it was kind of funny. Uh, so Irvine's kind of, um, it's hard to explain. How would you explain Irvine? It's Silicon Valley, but nicer. It, it is. It's really <laughs> Silicon Valley, isn't it? But it's south, right? Right. Um, but anyway, once I got settled in here, I went and I, I drove down to Laguna Beach, which is just gorgeous. And, and I realized, yeah, yeah, I really want to stay here. And so... Um, our games did very well, and I ended up creating my own company here, and, and I, I just never went home. I actually went back one point, and my house was just full with cobwebs, and my car was just <laughs> dead. <laughs> and I sold the house and just got rid of the car. And, oh, uh, wow. And that was me committed. Wow. So you, you committed. Was there a specific moment when you said, all right, this is it? <laughs> yeah, there was. Um, what happened was I... I needed to get a green card to stay here. And yeah. so once I got a green card, then I was able to start my own company. And that was that was really the big moment because that was a complete commit. Right. I'm going to stay in this country. And um, I had a team of great people at the time. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't have left those people for anything. So it was so key that uh, that we got a chance to make some games. The first game we made together was, was Earthworm Jim. Um, and that ended up doing very well for us. So Earthworm Jim. Yeah. Became, all right. became like a TV show on a toy line and all kinds of stuff. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that was really, really fun to, to build um, our own company. And we ended up licensing out. And what we realized is we we're very used to the idea, like I did Aladdin for Disney or mm -hmm. um, the Terminator movie, the Matrix movies. And so we were always licensing in. And with Earthworm Jim, we found we were doing the deals out. Mm. And that changed the game. And, and it's something that um, I, would, I would say, uh, as a Eureka thought, is 
sometimes there's money in places you don't expect, right? Mm. Um, we, we were making our games. We made a game once called MDK. And it was a 3D game and it was cool. Um, but it, we didn't have a marketing budget to spend on it. So it was never going to be huge. We couldn't blanket the country with this thing. Um, but we realized there's a lot of people making computers that need, that was in the days when you bought a computer, there was games pre-installed on it. Mm. And they were paying around a dollar per game to pre-install a game on the computer right, across right. enormous amounts of computers. And, w- and we discovered that that's where the money was. <laughs> the money mm. was in the in the mass distribution of your game, not in the selling it to these individual people paying full price for it. Mm. And um, every single, you know, the very first iMac? Yeah. Every single one had our game on it. Oh, that's like, fantastic. So, so that's that was just a different way of sort of thinking about um, how to distribute your, your whatever it is that you're creating. And so that's, I guess there's a thing there, which is don't always assume it's the obvious route. Sometimes there's another completely different um, way to go about it. So uh, talk about distribution because, and I don't want to, not meaning to totally skip timelines here, but you're in a very unique kind of business right now where distribution is, is, is key. Am, am I right? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's been a theme actually. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in, if you've got a business idea, can you think of a way to make it easier for people? And it sounds trivial, but that when you look at any business, you can make it easier. It's like Netflix is sending you DVDs and they were killing it. And then they decided to stream. It's a little easier. And so that's, that was a smart decision. And, and you can look at any business, like any business and say, can I make things go smoother, quicker, faster, less paperwork, less contracts. Um, and, and so that's just this ongoing thing that, that I was looking at the game industry going, how can we possibly get games delivered? Um, the experience delivered. Right. I, I don't really care about the code. What happened in, remember in audio, we used to have, um, you know, we'd, we'd own physical, LPs and things like that. We'd have all of our music in our hands, yeah. even cassette tapes. And then we moved to, to CDs and, and then we moved to MP3. By the time we got to MP3, I, I thought that was probably it because we're digital now. And, right, right. But I have all these files I've got to deal with, like MP3 files, thousands of them. And I've, all, and I've got to worry about the file naming on this one or the, the, the metadata in this one is, wrong, is different to this. Mm. So it doesn't appear correctly on my, on my MP3 player. So it seems like you're done. But then you realize you can just ask yourself the question, can you make it any easier? And you go, we look at an MP3 because, I mean, remember when Steve Jobs said, I have a thousand songs in my pocket. Right. Um, in reality, huge, um, mo- huge moment. That, that was mind blowing. Like, wait, what? <laughs> and, and so but again, then you go, can you make it easier? And that's that's why we have streaming of music. I actually don't care now about owning any physical music because mm. I just have everything online. Um, and. And those libraries are growing continuously. So I have just no work to do. I just have to listen to music. And so that was the thought with video games. Is there any way we can make that for video games? Every game ever played instantly wherever you are would be. So I call it end of the track thinking, which is what you do is you start with where you are. You think, how do I make it easier? How would I beat that? How would I beat that? Until you can't go any farther. And that's the end of the track. So if you're thinking about a business and you say, well, the end of the track is clearly that Um, for Amazon, that would be they sell every product in the world delivered everywhere else in the world instantly or as close to it. You know, currently one day is their target, right? They they started with books. Netflix started with DVDs. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So so if they if Netflix had every movie ever made. And, and they delivered on every device instantaneously at a very good price. I don't know if I would ever compete with that because that's the end of the track, right? Got it. How would you beat that? They've got everything. Um, so you ask yourself, does Netflix have everything? And no, they're losing massive brands like Disney and losing deals all the time. So much so they're having to make their own content to try to keep the, the library valid. And so y- you can see how they're not the end of the track. There's room for something else here that no one has yet delivered right and so it's just Got an interesting it. way to think about a business is is work your way down how would i beat it how would i beat it until i if that was delivered i can't think how to beat it so what you then do is start working on that mm. and you'll find investors get excited everyone wants to get behind you because you're doing something at that point 
that they're like, you know, if that happened, that would be incredible. And so that's, that's your challenge. And, and if you're even going that direction, you know, you're kind of headed in the right direction. So mm. that's something to think about. But, um, but that's what we were doing with cloud gaming. We were very early. Um, I, I, I was going to give a speech about it, so I patented it. <laughs> and then okay. I gave the speech. And then, we, then some people reached out and we actually started developing it for real. And, um, and in the end, Sony bought the company. So it was good. That's incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, take me take me down this um, end of the road with so, wh whatever you're working on today. Like, what what's what's going on? So today, the thought is um, a lot of companies. This is the thought. A lot of companies advertise, um, and to do that, you have to go through meetings with agencies and people and. There's lots of emails it's a, it's a and nightmare. lots of yeah. talking and lots of looking at things and discussions and planning. And if you're going to use an influencer, oh, we got to talk to the agent and get the influencer and get them all set up. Right. They're going to post, you know, three weeks from now, uh, Wednesday afternoon at 12 p.m. They're going to say these words and they're going to be written by me exactly the way they have to say them. And that's a nightmare. I, I mean, right. it doesn't. So the point is when it all happens and goes down, a lot of money changes hands. And you see a spike in sales that's all that's gone. You know the way the world works today. Twenty four hours and whatever happened on Instagram is history, right? Exactly. So you see the spike in sales, but then the question you would say to the brand is, how many of those spikes do you want? Mm. Like, do you want to do that once every currently ninety days, or would you like to have one of those once a month, once a week, mm. once a day, once an hour? And so. The question then becomes, if you want one, say like, if you want to spike once a day, what are you doing to make that possible? And the answer is in general, they don't have enough people. There isn't enough people to hire to manage all of that for them. Mm. Um, so there has to be a technology created that can actually deliver always on marketing for real, like mm. for real. And that means managing influencers and getting products to them and all of the, all of the stuff that happens um and collecting all the data and bringing it back but then actually building um almost like a, um you have to have some way to keep track and rate um how how people are doing and what they're doing across lots and lots of brands and so it becomes this the amount of data that you would need to look at um, becomes significant like it's complicated and and the idea being if done right this whole thing would just run like a machine and uh, I think of it as um, when Elon Musk said the car was going to drive itself, mm. a lot of people were like, I don't want that. I, I, I want to drive my own car, right? Take away my steering wheel from my cold, dead hands. I need to control my car. Um, and then, then Elon said something interesting, which was, but after the car's driven billions of miles safely, you become the risk. Like you, every time you touch the wheel, you introduce error. Right, because at some point, the you know, with enough experience, it could be a trillion miles. Doesn't matter. You can define the amount, but at some point, the car gets safer than humans, and so it's the same with marketing. I think there's this continuous need. Every time you ask someone what they want, they always, always tell you they want more work. They always think of some. Mm. Oh, if I just had a CRM management solution that's super complex with lots and lots of work to do. And it's like, but that doesn't scale. You don't scale. You'd have to have 50 of you. Right. And it would still limit you to what those 50 could output. And so you have to, there was a book years ago by Bill Gates where he, he talked about business at the speed of thought, which is basically what, what we really have to reach is a point where you trust in the systems. Mm. By all means, have a steering wheel so you can feel safe and comfortable and keep an eye on it. But at some point, you have to start stepping back and letting, letting the machine go. And um, and so that's the that's where we're at actually right now is um, so you have a machine and now you're starting to step we've built the tech. There's um, over we just passed seven thousand six hundred brands. That's using a, that's this, a lot of brands. Yes, yeah, using that's, this that's a lot today. Of um, but um, we still have the steering wheel on, so they're still in charge. But but my intention, which I have to do very gently over the next maybe twenty four months, is to slowly slowly wean them off the work and so for our listeners what what is it oh i should be clear on that so <laughs> so yeah the idea is um there's an intersection between e-commerce and 
and uh, and then attention, which is the thing that matters most to every brand. Right. I, I love to ask brands, uh, so do you have enough attention? Like, uh, <laughs> or how much is enough? Like, if we give you lots of attention, is that enough? Mm. And it's actually the one thing that's the most valuable to brands. It's the at the end of the day, they just can't get enough of it. And and so much so that's why Google and Facebook exist. Because because Google sells attention and Facebook sells attention. And look at the size of the companies that that generates. Mm -hmm. And so to try to think about how to, how to help brands manage attention, one of the things that we did, or just one of the things we do, is we help them understand who interacts with them. It's like you are taking care of your most important people, right? The Mm. Like if an influencer walks in your hotel or buys your products, you are taking care of them. And the answer is, how would we know? Like they don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and so this person on hold has 5 million followers and you've had them on hold for 45 minutes. Are you going to continue or are you going to get someone to answer the phone? That person needs, needs a response, right? Yep. And, and they don't know. That's just the way the world is today. This, this, the, the, because you don't know, that makes it, I guess, okay, because how would you know? And the answer, that's, that's like one piece of our puzzle is to let you know who's buying your products. So what we do is, is the brands um, have us try to help them understand who they've been interacting with. And you can just imagine some of the brands have 14,000 social media influencers in their data and they had no idea. And, you know, you're scrolling through screens of people with millions of followers that they have not interacted with, they've never. And so the first interaction with anyone that they really like should be, please don't ever buy our product again. From this day forward, you know, uh, you know, we'd like you to use the special link, which we provide, right. and, and please just have our products for free. Um, because these people are so insanely valuable if you care about attention, right? Which, oh, by the way, they all do. So that's the business we're in, is helping, helping brands really um, harness the, the, the authentic love for their products from the people who have an abundance of attention. And, um, and what does that really mean? Well, when you actually spend time with people who are celebrities or, or have a lot of followers, millions right. of followers, they very generally, um, very commonly don't make money um, from endorsements because they keep getting offered things they don't want to endorse. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a company called Denver Candles. Tell everybody these are the best can candles in the world. And it's like, I don't even like candles. I don't use candles. <sighs> okay, you know, and, and an influencer then has to promote that. That's horrible. They hate it. And, mm -hmm. and, and the minute they can afford not to do that, they stop immediately. And, um, and so the, the difference is if you ask them to promote something they like, I'm into photography. Mm -hmm. There's a certain kind of light that I like. It's called pro photo. Right. Um, if, if you, if, if pro photo were to offer me their lights and say, David, don't ever pay for our lights again, here you go. Um, but please make sure, you know, um, to pro to, photo, if you're listening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> David's interested. I'm all in. So, uh, and it's because it would be so authentic, right? I would authentically be telling you, I love the, this product. And and my through, audience through your per, this is through your purchasing habits already. Yes. So it's yes. verified. I'm in, I'm in their data. Fan. If they were ever to take a minute and look in their data, they're going to see. Um, but they had no idea that your photography Instagram has a million followers. Right. Well, not, well, not that. It yeah. Does, not but, that I do. But yeah. Right. Exactly. For exactly. And there's lots of influencers who are amazing at photography and and video and and of course that they they make their content creators really. Yeah. They're not really influencers. They make content. People love the content. They get addicted to the content. Um, the big difference, I think, is when I was young, um, the idea of celebrity was based upon whether they're in a movie or a sports star or something like that. Yeah. And you would spend this limited time seeing them on a big screen, like in a dark room. They're 80 feet wide and you're staring, you know, you're, and you learn their face so you can spot them a mile away. Mm -hmm. That makes them a celebrity because you're so familiar with them. Mm -hmm. um, with social media, you're getting the same thing. But instead of it being a movie every 18 months or two years, it's every day. I saw what they had for breakfast this mm -hmm. morning. Like, and so people feel so close with, uh, with the people they follow online. It, it's, it's hard for, for some of the parents uh, to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, they just think it's crazy, but it's not crazy. It's, they did the same thing. They were fans of rock, rock bands and fans of, of celebrity actors. Um, this is just an intimacy level that had never happened before. 
where you can actually, you know, you know the name of their dog and you see their right. life, you know, that's, that's a whole different thing. So we're trying to really get a hold of the authenticity part of it and make sure that we're, well, it's also, it's also more responsible to, instead of, you know, selling Cheerios through this influencer's channel. Like these are actually things that their followers are likely to want or need versus driving sales for random objects and items. <laughs> well, it's also, it's, it's actually, you've got to keep it real is you'll yeah. find a, a brand that makes bikinis thinks, you know what, this is, this is our new bikini. It's going to be so important to us. We're going to spend all of our marketing money and get the most beautiful model we can possibly afford. Yeah. And they do that. And she wears the bikini and the sales don't move. Mm. And then they're like, it didn't work. What happened? Mm. And, you know, she's incredible. Our bikini's beautiful. What happened? And the answer is her followers are all male because she's a female. And so that's that. Uh, that's the problem is you have, to, also, you have to. Yeah, you have to understand what is it? Who are you speaking to and why are they following the people that you're trying to work with? And so you see the authenticity matters there, too. Um, you see that quite often, um, you know, there's all kinds of, of crazy examples where people are trying to, um, they just assume that by posting anything to social media, it's just going to work. But in reality, they have to understand, you know, who is the audience they're trying to get to and, and where does that audience actually go um, on social media? And so, but anyway, at the end of the day, authenticity is just, it's the nuclear bomb um, I'll give you one more example is there was a 12, a 12 year old girl. Um, we, um, my daughter, she's a friend of my daughter and there was lots of girls. We had a dinner, uh, 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 we were at some restaurant in Los Angeles and her mother was sitting beside me and I, and this was a pretty big influencer on, uh, on TikTok, Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was, uh, we were talking, she knew I was interested. And so the mother was sort of telling me what, what goes down and they go to a, like a conference for, um, like some kind of conference in Los Angeles where they have a lot of makeup and they'll find that their hotel room is just covered in makeup. And, um, and when I say covered, I mean, every surface in the room is covered in makeup because they're paying agencies, um, to distribute that makeup to influencers. And the, the makeup company thinks they're being kind of clever by filling the room with it and, and putting it all over the bed and everywhere. So the whole room is just makeup. Um, but, but again, they don't understand that this is a 12 year old girl that doesn't wear makeup. And so she comes in the room, takes out her camera cause it's, it's, she's a content creator and she films how ridiculous this looks. Right. And then she leaves because she doesn't want any of it. And, 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 so I was sitting there going, well, oh, that's terrible. I mean, that's, wow. that's a disaster for those marketing companies that convinced all the brands to put the stuff in there. Right. Um, and then she turns and one of the girls said, oh, I love your backpack. And she goes, oh, I love this backpack. This is my favorite backpack. I take it everywhere. And she starts gushing about is a white backpack that was really nice. And, and I remember sitting at the table going, I'd prefer to be the backpack company. And that was that was one of the moments that got me convinced to do this was seeing the authenticity of what just went down there. Like one minute she's showing us a video of of all of these brands that are that are spending money marketing but not getting anywhere, and then you're seeing an authentic product that she loves and paid for, um, and she's gushing about it because she loves it, and all these other girls at the table are hearing it. And so that that's that's the that's core, the difference. That's the core piece. I think. I think that's missed dramatically. And then, and then of course you have all the analytics and everything else that go with that, but it's definitely a, it's a fascinating space. Thank you for, for sharing all of that, diving into your background and then coming all the way to today. And thank you for being a part of the Eureka family here. Um, I'm, I love that you help entrepreneurs. <laughs> uh, I do that. I, I'm one of the, few people that try to respond to entrepreneurs whenever they have questions so that, that, and they're, they're usually like, I just wrote to five people and you're the only person that responded. And I like to, to, to help as much as I can to build a whole building and do that, I think is incredible. And to get um, all the cool speakers and stuff you get here, I've been to the events and they're very, very, very impressive. Um, and you know, you get some really interesting tech demos and things going on here too. We were very close to renting space in the actual Eureka building. Um, very, very close. We ended up, one of our investors 
um, had some space on a, on a, on a skyscraper. And so we ended up going with that because it's because we're dealing with brands. We want to have somewhere that was, that, uh, looked really cool, but the, um, the vibe here is, is priceless. And, and I love that, um, Peter and the team have been supporting this and, and it's been for some time like this, this building has been here for a good, I, I'm not sure exactly what year it started, but it's a good amount of time. Um, all I know is I first walked in here six years ago and the mm-hmm. first person I interacted with is now my wife. And so oh, they started, Works for you. started my first business here, <laughs> started all the good things in my life have started out of this building. So, I mean, I've, I'm a walking example of Eureka moments. So. <laughs> That's great. No, there really are. There's a lot of talent here. I got, I got a tour a few times now where I've got to meet a lot of the talent here and, um, and Peter as well, and the, 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 the events they put on, and some of the people they bring to them are fascinating. And so I've uh, like like David Perry. No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm like the tallest person. That's for sure. <laughs> for uh, sure. For sure. But um, no, it's like one of the things I used to go to the TED conferences a lot, and the yep. TED conferences, it seems like it's all about the the speeches, but it's also all about the networking that right. you're getting to sort of talk to Jeff Bezos or talk to Bill Gates because they're there. And that that ability to um, sort of meet these people uh, in a casual setting where they weren't stressed out was really, really worth its weight in gold. And so um, I think that's something that I've found with the Eureka events. I've met some people that have really impressed me and um, and it's very relaxed. So it's not you know, the guards are down. It doesn't, they don't feel like they're, they're on stage. And I think that's really, really helpful. David, we're just about hitting our time here. Any, any closing thoughts, anything else that you'd like to share? I think um, probably the thing that I, uh, one of the little sort of secret that I, that's worked for me, whether it's worked for anybody else is, um, in whatever you do, whatever situation you find yourself in, if there's something that you can learn from it, um, and I, w- what I mean by that, if someone says, let's go skydiving, and you're like, I don't want to go skydiving, then you're like, oh, I got to go skydiving because I got to understand how that all works, right? right? And then those photography, making videos, electronics, um, programming, riding horses, surfing, you know, scuba diving, I don't care what it is, Mm. you have to do it. And it doesn't mean you have to like it. You can go, oh, surfing's not for me. That's fine. But you've now surfed. And what the reason I say this is because in business, you're constantly meeting new people. Mm. And they always have a thing that they're into. Mm. And when you've done that thing, and you understand it, and you can talk about it with them, you get you can create an immediate rapport with them. And I used to do that. Um, I would sit on an airplane and I'd look to the guy beside me and I would go, I wonder what it is. There's something that we can talk about and I'm going to work it out. And, and, and we will, you know, we chat and, and usually there's something really, or they're really, they're really into something into water skiing. I did water skiing in England in, in, in Thorpe Park, which is where the, all the championships are held. And boom, he's real interested in that. Now we've got something going. Um, the, the, the funniest one I had was a guy I turned to and I, and I was asking him, what do you do? And he said, I sell ore, you know, and I'm like, ore, <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> oh, you wow. got me. I know nothing about ore, you know? <laughs> and, and so, but we start talking a little bit and it turns out he's into tennis as a hobby. And I go, oh, I got this game with me, you know, where I can play tennis on my Sony PSP, my little handheld. And he goes, I invested into that game. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. wait, what? I know the guys that made this game. And so we had a media rapport. And then he goes, I'm going to go and see you two tonight in Madison Square Garden. Would you like to join me? <laughs> so, wow. okay, let's go. So I, I we end up in Madison Square Garden. This dude was super rich and he, he had the entire row right over the stage. And, um, and, it, and it was just the two of us in this row. And uh, it was just one of those examples where I sat there listening to you two, who I love, um, thinking to myself, if I hadn't have turned and and said hi, I would not be sitting here right now. And I think that's the part. I once gave a commencement speech um, at a university in in Ireland, and I was talking about that, how it's not all just planned. A lot of it, doors open. Mm. You have to be willing to walk through those doors when those doors open. And and when I finished my speech, 
the dean was really angry at me because he's like, it's not about luck. It's about education. Oh, man. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not really. The education's really helpful. But going through the doors and opening doors um, is, is a lot of, of where you end up. And, and so um, I, I would say definitely. And, and the trick is to be able to, to handle the conversation wherever that conversation is going to go. Wow. What an awesome piece of advice to go and, and, and do more and live a more enriching life and, and try out these things so that you can relate with more people and open more doors and potentially find yourself in Madison square garden watching you too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you never I, know. I literally ended up one time at, uh, at, uh, with Michael Jackson in his house in, in Neverland there. and it's this <laughs> same kind of thing where it's this weird set of things that occurs um, that makes it work and, and so you you end up in these situations I remember thinking to myself how did this happen and it's hard to even sort of work that all out because mm. it's it's a whole chain of events that occurs but um, I guess that's the point is the world is uh, the journey that someone is on they're sitting in their cubicle or whatever typing and and that's not that's not the limit of what of what can happen to you as you as you travel and uh and as you interact with people the opportunities are, are just endless and so that's the thing i've enjoyed the most i think david thank you so much for coming on today um Please let me know in the comments below if you have any questions for David, and I'm sh I'll be sure to pass those along. David, is there anywhere where people can follow you? Are you followable? LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, anywhere? <sighs> to be honest, uh, it's a little sad because I actually don't uh, I don't keep my social media up hardly at all. Um, uh, I've started a, a photography website for my photography, which is David Perry Photography, but I, I it's just a hobby. Um, I I don't really do a lot I, I i have a website called dperry.com but i don't even remember the last time i updated it i, I have this plan that once i get my life back <laughs> some point in the future i want to i'm going to get back to game programming so i'm going to do some more game programming and that's when i'm going to sort out all of this kind of social um you know stuff and start writing blogs again awesome well we'll we'll check out your photography and we're going to encourage you to to start living your passion. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care.